Welcome, everyone. My name is Doug Ulwick. I am the president of the Historical Society of Old Abington, and this is a wonderful turnout. Thank you all for being here today. Um, it promises to be a very interesting program, uh, and we'll see some stuff that's seldom seen, which is kind of fun. But anyway, we always start our programs with a salute to the flag. So if, if those who are able and willing, please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, you may be seated. So the Historical Society of Old Abington um, represents the interests, historical interests of the towns of Abington, Rockland, and Whitman, which up until the 1870s were one town, the town of Old Abington as we now refer to it. Uh, the Historical Society puts on typically six programs like this every year, three in the fall, three in the spring. We refer to them as our fall semester and our spring semester. They used to be programs where someone would come in and stand up here and talk to you for 45 minutes about something. And we changed them a few years ago to be conversations where we talk about various things. And you as an audience are welcome to participate. If you have come up with a question or something, raise your hand and, and you're, you're welcome to do that. It's very interactive and I think more interesting that way. So uh, it's turned out well for us because we can do topics where there isn't anyone who can stand up here and talk to you for 45 minutes about something. But at the same time, they can have a conversation about what they know. So it seems to work out pretty well. Um, today's topic will be, uh, we do show and tells, we try to do them like, we're going to try to do them like once a year, uh, where we take one particular topic and invite people in with um, memorabilia or, or whatever on that topic. When we proposed this back in the fall, um, the first people to stand up and say, me, was uh, the dire organization themselves. And I said, fantastic, because there's stuff in here people don't get to see. We have one more program coming up, the first of uh, first Sunday in April. I think it's April 2nd, actually. And that one is going to be, there's actually cards on the table for it already, um, that old town religion. And we're going to kind of look at how the different religions arrived in the old town. I like to say in waves, and they kind of did. I mean, suddenly we had Methodist churches, and suddenly we had uh, Unitarian churches, and suddenly we had Baptist churches. They didn't kind of come in sporadically. They kind of came in waves. And then what happened to them? And this was inspired by the last year's closing of the Congregational Church in Rockland. I don't know if they finished their paperwork and done, but I think we've received some of their paperwork here. Um, and it was, it was a, something we hadn't seen in a while, a, a long time established church closing. Um, the topic was pretty raw and it kind of still is. So we're actually looking at the bigger picture and saying, when did churches come to town? What happened? Did they disappear? Did they merge? Did they close? and looking at the bigger picture, and we'll include the Congregational Church in Rockland in that at the same time. So we'll address it, but not focus just on it. So that's coming up. And I think that'll be the last one of the season. We're gonna get a little bit of a business meeting in on that one too. We're proposing a few changes. Um, our annual membership, which is typically, which has been for a long time, $12 a year. Uh, for the annual, we're going to propose to change to it to a suggested donation of, I don't know, what's 20 or $25, but whatever. And then our um, lifetime membership was 75 and we're proposing to bump that up to 100. Uh, we're also talking about creating a members only Facebook page. Those are kind of fun because no ads, no anything else, and you have to be allowed in it 
but as a place to freely exchange ideas and topics of what's going on in the three towns, uh, particularly historically related. So that's something that's on the horizon too. So next meeting, we'll talk about that a little bit as well. But on to today's topic, we actually have three speakers who are going to guide us through this. And it's on the Dyer family, the Dyer, particularly Sam Dyer in particular, um, there, they had this wonderful mansion in town uh, that they came, that he came back to after time in Europe, which I won't jump ahead too much here. Um, and they were wonderful, you know, hosts and they, benefactors and whatever. Um, and when he passed um, without heirs, well, I suppose his heir was his niece, um, there was a collection of stuff and there was also the foundation for creating this building in this collection. So that's what we're going to hear about today. And the first speaker I'd like to invite forward and we we'll, might do one at a time. We might have a few join us up here if we're kind of overlapping territory here. But I'd like to invite Deb Damon to come forward. And she's going to tell us a lot about... Uh, <laughs> you'll be fine. She's going to tell us a lot about Sam Dyer. Please join me. Relax. I don't think so. I think that's the microphone. So my, our videographer left it there. Okay. Messy, messy. Hello. Anyway, so Deb, um, we've known each other like forever. We grew Pretty up much. like four houses apart. We graduated from Abington High School the same year. We did. And you're now blissfully retired, blissfully I think, at this retired, point. Retired, absolutely. From yes. an HR career. Yes. Okay. That's right. And anything else the audience should know? No, at retirement is good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're going to hear an argument on that. No, it's I really good. don't. Yeah. No, yeah. it's really good. And, and um, when I retired, I started volunteering here, which um, has been one of the joys of my retirement. Um, I've learned an awful lot, and um, and I, I'm under great tutelage um, um, from Merlin, and, and uh, it's just it's just a wonderful place to volunteer. So Yay. think about that when you're in retirement. <laughs> 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 oh yeah, and Pete's Pete's one of the volunteers too, yeah. <laughs> and Eileen, who you'll hear from later, also yeah. So we kind of we're everywhere. The Dyer gang. The, the Dyer okay. gang. Okay, right? and, and and you grew up in Abington. You didn't move far away. No, I'm I'm about half a mile over the border. Well, yeah. you're in Rockland though. I am, we cover which is Rockland. Okay, right. So yeah. you're still okay. I'm okay. We'll talk to you. Okay. All right. That's good. <laughs> that's good. Anyway, you've done a deep dive into Sam Dyer. Yeah, as and, deep as I could get. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. Tell us, and I've got. First of all, that's what he looked like. That's him, and that's also him. The picture in the back. The the portrait uh, in the other room is yeah. also him, um, and um, when I first started. Um, getting to know Sam, it was through letters that had been written to him um, and through some of his stuff. And um, at first it was just, yeah, this is this guy. And by the end of it, I was in love with him. <laughs> because because okay. he was really a nice man nice. and a very interesting man um, who was interested in a lot of different things. And so, yeah, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Please. Yeah. Um, so born in 1809. Um, and I mentioned to Merlin this morning, if you're trying to get an idea of 1809, in 1809 there were 50,000 slaves in New York City. Mm -hmm. So, and there, so there were obviously slaves in this population too. Um, so it was a very, very different world um, than we can understand, obviously. Um, he went to school in Abington for part of his life. In his own words, he loved doing accounting work he went to work for um, his father at uh, Dyer and Brown, which was like a general store, I guess. And then um, at some point, he worked at a couple of other places and ended up at another general store in Bridgewater doing as a clerk, you know, and he really loved to keep track of money and that kind of thing. It was kind of his thing. Um, and let's see, uh, why don't you go to the next picture? Sure. In 1833, in July of 1833, he married this woman. Her name was Abby Jones. And from what we can tell, he had gone to work for a bank in Boston. The name of the bank, some people call it the Hancock Bank. He actually referred to it as a Tremont Bank. Might have been the street, not exactly sure. But probably they met there, um, I would expect. Um, her veil, which she's wearing right there, which is very beautiful, we actually have here. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, it is in very, very delicate condition, so it's not one of those things that we could put out, but there are other parts of Abby's 
um, stuff um, <laughs> in the in the cabinet up there. Um, we do have a love letter that she wrote to Sam in 1832. Um, the print was tiny, 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 but I was able to um, extract the first few lines. Um, and once again, it's mentioned in the, in the, and I hope you do all go take a look at what, what's in the other room. But she's referring to him as her dearest one and how difficult it is for them to be apart and that kind of thing. So it was really very lovely. So they were married in July of 1833. She was 19, he was 24. And, um, she only lived for three months. Wow. She was in a terrible carriage accident, and um, she died of internal hemorrhage and was buried at St. Paul's Church Cemetery in Boston. Boston. Um, until 1884, when Sam had her exhumed and moved to Mount Vernon. <laughs> so, wait, so how many years was that? That's a lot of years. It's, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah, not a math major. Huh, I'm sorry. It was like, it was like 50, 50 some odd years, yeah. And so my belief is that he did that um, because they were, he was planning he was what was going to happen. Anticipating his own demise. His own demise, okay. and, right, that kind of thing. And, and I don't know if you've seen, if you've gone through the uh, Ver Mount Vernon, but there's quite a, an obelisk um, for the Dyer family mm -hmm. in there. Um, at any rate, so it's very sad. Um, she didn't get to live very long at all. After that, um, he moved um, to London. And he had a passport. <laughs> yeah, so this passport is actually, uh, I'm going to talk more about this passport. Mm -hmm. he, in 18, he, he moved in 1837. It was not required to have a passport um, at that time. Um, you could go from country to country to country. No one cared. This is actually dated 1862, so this is later on, and I'll go back to this. But the interesting thing about his passport, aside from the fact that it has his basic information, is that it's signed by William Seward. William Seward of Seward's Folly. Seward's Folly, right. Alaska. William Seward, who was the Secretary of State under Lincoln. William Seward, who was stabbed in the neck the night that Lincoln was shot. You remember someone broke into his home and stabbed him. He survived. But, um, but yeah, William Seward... Um, and we actually have William Seward going to Paris and visiting with some of um, Sam's friends um, later on. So we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay. So Sam went to London. He was working in importing and exporting. Um, there was a company formed in New York called the John Monroe Bank. It was basically uh, dealt with maritime transport. If you're in the you know, importing, exporting, you're having to deal with that kind of a bank. That bank became the preeminent bank that um, people in London, and, or in England actually, and France used in dealing with the United States. It was first opened in New York City, and then a subsidiary was opened in Paris, and Sam ended up working there. Um, he moved to Paris. The address that he was at was 5 Rue de la Paix, which is just over to the right. Um, and so he was within walking distance of all of the great stuff that Paris has to offer and had to offer at that time. So yeah, so this, I love this picture because it shows the Tuileries in the front and then the Place de la Concorde and then in the back you see the Arc de Triomphe. So just kind of a neat picture and, and you can imagine him in his top hat and his cane wandering around here, you know, having a jolly old time in Paris. And he did have a jolly old time in Paris. Um, oh. Some of his, yes he did. <laughs> um, so, we are so lucky to have the letters of a, a gentleman named Nathan Chandler, who wrote quite regularly to Sam um, and talked about the old days, you know, and how he missed them going to different restaurants and bars like Trois Frères and Café Lublin. And uh, there's one of his letters he talks about that he had gone back to Paris. Um, this was after Sam had returned to the U.S. He'd gone back to Paris, Chandler did, and visited the old haunts that he and you know his friends used to visit, and he said you know it was terrible because there were no oysters and no you know none of <laughs> this wonderful food, no champagne and no dyer and no all of it, the other friends he used to sit and he said it was very sad and there was one restaurant that he was going to go into that Sam used to steal his um, brandy and sugar when they would go to together and he couldn't bring himself to go in because it, it would just make him so sad. So the letters were really kind of fun. Um, they talked 
talked a little bit about the family. I got to know a little bit about Sam, what Sam was like personally. Um, Sam, at one point, bought uh, Chandler's daughter, apparently a, a, a pretty expensive ring, and sent it off to her. And the letter that Chandler writes about how excited the daughter was and how she's going around everywhere showing all of her friends all about this, you know, it was just kind of a really nice thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, at any rate, so he was in Paris until 1862, where he came, when he came back to the U.S. And at that time, of course, the war is going on. And, um, and so, you know, things are kind of messy. We also have a letter that he wrote to his niece, that Sam actually wrote to his niece, that is complaining about the disarray that his funds are in because of the war. Um, you know, and he was heavily invested in cotton and rubber and all these things. And you can imagine what a war does, especially on your own turf, to mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff. And he mentions in his letter that he's not sure whether he has a dollar to his name. And I'm sure it's, that wasn't the case. <laughs> but, what I'm, but what I'm saying <laughs> is that he was just, it was just a, a total mess for him. Kind of, kind yeah. of insecurity. Yeah. Yeah. So we can go to the next one, I yeah, guess. Yeah, the next one is the yeah, piece so this of is, this is, ceramic. This is the ugly ceramic, yeah. It really is uh, ugly. It really is ugly. And I'm glad you said it first. There's a reason that yeah, it's ugly. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things, and probably some of you know this, that, that was very common in the middle to late 1800s with ladies would hand paint porcelain blanks. If you've ever seen um, the movie Little Women um, with um, Winona Ryder, yes. Her sister, Amy, at one point is painting a teacup. It was a thing. Um, ladies painted porcelain. So I'm sure that Sam bought this as a blank and one of his nieces painted that. I'm absolutely positive. But the neat thing about this is that when you, on the bottom, it says, um, and it's very faint, but it says Samuel um, B. Dyer, mm -hmm. 5 Rue de la Paix, which is the address for John Monroe. So we know he got it in France. There's a mark in the middle that, that is probably from where it was bought. And then there's this little plug thing over here that thing. actually has some embossed letters in it. And I can't exactly tell, but I think it's probably the um, uh, Albert Beck Company. But I don't know for sure. But at any rate, um, it's kind of a neat thing. And so he brought this back and someone painted it really badly. <laughs> but that's in there too. So yeah. You, you can, can judge for yourself. You can look yeah. at some bad porcelain. It's good. <laughs> Go on. Sure. Okay, so this is where this becomes really interesting. So Charles F. Adams is the son of John Quincy Adams. And he at one point was a senator. Um, and then was appointed to be the foreign minister to Great Britain. And this document authorizes Sam Dyer to transport um, or to be a dispatch, uh, a dispatcher for um, documents between the United States, Great Britain, and France in, 19, in 1862. So like an official envoy. It's an official envoy. So, you know, so it's just like, wow. He's not just an Abington boy, you know what I mean? Um, he knew, and, and honestly from his letters you can kind of tell that he knew some fairly famous people. Um, Chandler at one point makes reference to the fact that he, when, when he went back to Paris, as a matter of fact, that he was having dinner with um, Seward. Um, and so, you know, it was, they, the bank was substantial. Dyer was one of the principals in the bank. They knew people. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so this is that document. It was issued in 1862. If you go back to the Seward, you don't have to, but if you go back to the Seward passport, there were no passports. Um, people didn't get passports unless very, very well-to-do gentlemen a pa could get a passport from the government, but it was only used to buy them favor when they went to another country. Ah, oh, I have this passport, you know, <laughs> let me into this. I, I or, really am you know, American. I really, I, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> but they weren't required. They weren't required until the Civil War. And so Seward, in 1862, you know, the war started in 61, right? So this is a, a passport Seward required during the Civil War that everyone who went to another country had a pa an American passport. And then that stopped after the Civil War, and you didn't have to have a passport again until World War I. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. kind of cool, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you don't think about, yeah. Um, did, what school did he go to after Abington High? Because he seems, I don't think any. He seems very well. Um, yeah, I think a lot of it was self-education. And we have, we have books of his, even up to when he was 
close to death. In fact, the year he died, there's a book that he signed on the year he died that he must have bought, How to Think in French. <laughs> you know, so I mean, I think he was very, you know, he was very much a self-educated kind of person. Who could write that book? I know. Yeah, yeah and you'll see some of his books. There's a, a French book in there, his, an, an activity book that he yes. had in there, too. <laughs> That's cool. Okay. okay. Okay, and that's the house. That's where he came back to. So he came back in, in 1862, um, but in 1862, he also had to go back to Europe doing this dis dispatch envoy work mm -hmm. and he actually wrote a letter to his niece complaining about it oh. um, you know why do I have to cross the ocean you know that kind of thing but um, but yeah so this is the house it's, not surprisingly it has a mansard roof right and it's second what, empire right second French empire, style otherwise known it was the roof was used by architect Louis Mansart at the Louvre and that's where it first came into prominence. Okay. So to come back to Abington and bring a little bit of French architecture. Well, he was very much a him. Francophile for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. So we know that he came back eventually in 62, 63 and started building the house um, around 1867. Am I right? That's thanks to Pete Walters. Okay, yes. thank you, Pete. <laughs> About 1867, the house was completed um, and he moved in um, and invited his brother. Uh, James and who was a widow and a widower sorry and um, and James's daughters to move in of which there were several of which there were several <laughs> before we move on from this I do want to point out this is from a stereo card so we have the bizarre ability to see this in 3d with the proper viewer so but without the ability cool. to project it that way, I didn't bother to, but just wanted to make note of the fact that stereo photography was some, a big thing about the time the house was built. So he had it recorded by a, by a stereographer. And we think that's him on the front porch sitting in the doorway. We're not it sure. could very well it be. It could be him. Yeah. Anyway, but yes, it was then populated by, yeah, the oh sisters. my goodness, did he have any sons? I, this is the, the brother. Um, I think there was a James Jr., there right? There were eight children. Okay. Yeah. And, and only, uh, it appears that probably only four of them moved in okay. along with James. Okay. Uh, Marietta was the youngest. Then there were the Irish twins, Amelia and I'm linking the next sister. Abby, 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 Abby. Oh, okay. Okay. And then, Abby was the uh, youngest. Then there was uh, Samuel the second. And ah. so, the other thing is, we call him Sam. He never once, and we have no other records That's indicating true. this, that he ever used the name Sam. He um, was Samuel. It was Samuel yeah. or S.B. or Dyer. Okay. He, uh, a letter to his niece, he signed it, Samuel B. Dyer. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah, he was very formal. The formality yeah. stayed. Yes. But I, I like this because the same fence in the background we just saw in the last slide, so you can kind of tell exactly where. It was in this corner. Yeah, it was seated in that corner. The house is gone. I will. I will be speaking to them. She will. More about it. But it it is gone, unfortunately. Okay. So um, you you are, but um, I I, final question. If well, there might be more, but um. What spoke to you most about this? You've talked that he, I think he became like a real person to you. You said, I'm in love with him. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I guess because I, I'm kind of a Francophile too, okay. because he walked where I've walked. So that was kind of, you know, that was kind of fun. Um, but also he was just a kind person. Okay. Um, and um, his, the letters from Chandler and the stories that Chandler said, do you remember when we did this? Do you remember when we did that? Oh, I want to hang out with them too. You know, right. it was kind of a fun kind of guy, you know. Um, and he was also very, very generous with, uh, with his money, um, you know, in terms of, you know, the library. And I think that, that um, uh, um, Merlin will talk about mm -hmm. that a little bit. Um, and, you know, and then ultimately where we sit, mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, coming down through the family, uh, the nice little things that he did for people. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I just kind of liked him a lot. That's great. Yeah. Did he ever remarry? Or no, he never did. Well, no. He actually didn't, didn't marry. No, then. he he stayed single the whole time, and and his his nieces kind of I guess took over as as their, his hostess. And I know that that um, that uh, Marietta did when uh, he was older. 
Any other questions before we let Deb go? Yes, Marilyn. Where did he go to school in Abington? Where was the school then? I don't know where the school was. I'm not sure we can, we know where the school was. Isn't there one on the side street here? No. The thing is, is that he only went to, he only appears to have had a formal education until the age of 10. Mm -hmm. um, and Eileen went and looked through, uh, I think, both of the Hobart histories of the town. We were also searching for information about all of the family members mm -hmm. who may have graduated from the high school. And he was not listed. Yeah. He was not listed in there. Some so of his yeah. nieces were, but he was never. He okay. does mention at one point in his own <laughs> writing about, about an academy. But right. Yeah. We do have that. There is a, is another academy, and we can, we can pull that out yeah. for you yeah. as well. And isn't there one on, in Rockland, or right on the corner, that big old house? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. It be an academy of some sort. Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. Just wondering, does he talk much about the friends that he had in Abington? Was he, was he so he has lots of pictures. Mm -hmm. Lots of pictures, of, but we really don't have a lot of writing by him. Mm -hmm. Of all of the letters that I went through, there was only one that he actually wrote himself. Huh, and because who keeps, you know, you keep your own letters. Your own letters yeah. you know? <laughs> and I think we have it because he wrote it to his niece. Uh, um, but, stayed in the you know, family. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. No, I mean, I, I know that his friends in Paris names were Richard, Sumner, Clark. Um, you know, in fact, I went down a rabbit hole a while on Sumner because I thought it was probably Charles Sumner, and I'm not exactly sure it wasn't yet, but it might have been. Um, but there are some things that are a little wrong about that. Um, but at any rate, you know, I think that they were probably people, you know, he was in Paris for a long time. He was in Europe for a long time. But he does have prominent Abingtonian pictures in his, you know, in his, um, in his photo albums. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> And next, I'd like to invite forth Eileen Waltz. <laughs> Eileen's going to actually talk more about the articles in yeah. the show and tell, if you will. Hi. There's um, an exhibit in the Sam Dyer room next door. I should now start saying Samuel B. Dyer room <laughs> next door, shouldn't I? Apparently, that's what he would have liked. And uh, anyway, there are some select pieces we have called forth with photographs, thanks to Merlin who photographed them. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about those and why they were important, how they fit into the lives. Um, I actually added another photo myself of something that's in the collection, it's too big to move. We'll get to that. Um, anyway, so you are a retired teacher. Yes, I am. Also from Abington, yeah. still living in Abington. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you feel the same about retirement that Deb does? Yes, <laughs> okay. yes. It, retirement is good. <laughs> <laughs> but you've stayed very active, obviously, mm, yeah, and that's yeah. kind of cool. So uh, <laughs> anyway, here, here in other places, yes. so that's cool. Anything else the audience should know about you here and on cable or... No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is, a, this I, is it. I, I, I had to ask. Yeah. Come on. No. Can't it's think of a thing. Kind of necessary when you got someone sitting across <laughs> yeah. from you. So anyway. Uh, okay. So the various pieces. I only reproduced one side of this, this jug. Okay. Uh, the Jefferson and... Um, okay. One, one side, one end. Right. Um, this is... It, this is an import? This is... Yes. It was made in Liverpool. But uh, just... Before talking about a specific one, when oh, you the when there. you look at behind your head. thank you. When you I'm look sorry, at the cameraman, <laughs> uh, the things in the uh, in the exhibit, and the things that you'll see here, the thing that struck me was that much like Samuel's life, it's a combination of American things and European things. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you're going to see. Uh, we'll talk about some of them, but you'll see additional pieces in the exhibit. Again, some American, some European. Uh, there's uh, bohemian glass from Czechoslovakia, um, and at the same time there's sandwich glass um, from America. So it, it, his life was Europe and America, and his things are Europe and America. And just before, again, before we get to this, even if you look in this room, mm -hmm. the things that you see here were uh, belongings of the Dyer family. And I think you can probably tell just by looking at things, what was European, what was American. These clocks and candelabras, one, two, three sets, uh, were made by a very famous French company called the 
Frere, Rango Frere, or Frere Rango, the Frere brothers, started very early in the 1800s, and it, it, it was such an important company and so well liked that Napoleon had um, some of their products and so on. So when I look at those, I think to myself, there's no way that was in an American home to begin with. Um, but it wound up in Samuel's Not home. the American homes we know. Right, exactly. <laughs> and then at the same, oh, and the vase is European. Um, and although I think that these uh, bronze statues that you see around here, most likely also European, but some of the um, subject matter is American like that, to me is a um, World War I um, G.I. Joe mm -hmm. kind of guy. And then American, these portraits also came from the Dyer household. They were his, some of his ancestors. Uh, mm -hmm. She was a Dyer who married a Hopart, and then they had Sally okay. Hopart. Um, and the clock over there, would that be American? I think that also was European too, although I don't know what kind of eagle that is. <laughs> so and the, okay. the, well, maybe it would be an American. We do have the innards to that clock, but it's out being repaired. Because they're all from the 1800s, too, so that's... We don't wind them on a regular ago. basis. No, I know, it. yeah. Um, and There's only one clock that works in here that I can see, so I know if we're going over. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay, I'll talk faster. And, um, no, don't, don't I know. And the other thing is, in terms of these belongings, um, the dyer has kind of acquired them, I think, in two different ways. One would be donations. Um, and donations still come in to us today, not necessarily from the Dyer family, but you never know. And also, uh, when Marietta, it's this is Marietta's idea, this, this library using her um, uncle's money. Um, and most of the belongings in the house were sold at auction at one point so that the money could be used to fund all these kinds of things. And I think she stipulated anything that wasn't sold would be brought to part the, of the collection. Part of the collection. Mm -hmm. so, we got some from donations, we got some because they, they didn't sell. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this, this to me is really exemplary of Europe and America because this is called Liverpool Creamware. I think Don can. Yeah, it's a Liverpool joke. It's, it's a little early for uh, Samuel Dyer. It was in the federal period up to about 1825. Okay, this, from, from the research that had been done prior yeah. to me, just what I read, this was made in 1810. And it's not painted, it's transfer wear. Mm -hmm. um, but, so it's made in Liverpool, England, but the scenes on it are American. That is uh, the ship, the Jefferson, and on the other side is Thomas Jefferson, a transfer for, of his picture. And surrounding Thomas Jefferson, and you'll see it in there, um, are the, thir the, there are more than 13 states when he's president, but all the states that existed when he was president of the United States. And some of the cream wear, um, was made to order, and they would have initials on it, and you can see the initials there, A.D. I'd love to think that it was his wife, but it's too early. So mm -hmm. it may have been, he also had a niece named Abby Dyer, so it may have been that. So that's kind of American and European, American mm -hmm. scenery, but made in Liverpool. And people still collect it, and this, um, <clears throat> this actually is probably worth somewhere in the four figures, which, go figure, but... We're not selling it. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Oh, this is some of the Bohemian glass that I mentioned. And yeah, it is beautiful. And if you look, you can see the deer yeah. and they're matching pieces. This is a chalice. This is called a bowl. Um, and they both have the deer on it. It was probably made, again, in the 1800s in Czechoslovakia. I'm assuming that Samuel got it while he was in Europe. Mm, makes sense. Furnished his house there with it. Absolutely. Oh, um, this brings the American part back. <laughs> a wealthy fa family, as the Dyers could afford, I'm sure, pretty much anything they wanted. And in the late 1800s, Victorian times, um, both in England, Europe and in America, wealthy ladies would have tea, luncheon, uh, uh, afternoon teas. And so I envision Marietta, who became, was the hostess for Samuel, um, had afternoon teas, like on the lawn. We saw the sisters. Absolutely. And typically they would get dressed up, long gloves, maybe jewelry. There's some jewelry in there that I love that I'm, I'm again, picturing uh, Marietta wearing at these teas. And they would serve their tea or coffee in these beautiful sets. And I guess I always thought that really wealthy people would have solid silver. But this is a silver-plated set. And um, 
so at first I was like, oh, really? They kind of went cheap on that, except when I did a little research, um, it was made by a company in New England. And I kind of like that about them, too, that they could have afforded something from anywhere and they stayed in New England and bought this set. It was made by the Meriden Company mm -hmm. in uh, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. The company started in around 1810 itself. And <clears throat> by 1870s, it was the number one uh, silverware producing company in the world. It was very well known. There are pieces in just about every major museum that was made by, that were made by this company, and it's silver plated. But it was silver plated with something, so it's called the um, Meridian Britannia, Britannia Company, because they used a special alloy to make their silver plate, mm -hmm. and it was the best in the world, and it was known for being um, very shiny and sparkly and, and lasted. Um, and there are more pieces to this set, but we only put out the three, because you get the idea, <laughs> um, but when there's a close-up, I think of. Did Would you that use have that? been before? Yes. Before or after Gorham? Um, I, it probably was around the same, the same time. time, right? Thinking. Um, but you can, I mean, exactly. just look at the work. I know there are flowers, there are ribbons, <clears throat> there are there are birds. The um, feet have, yeah. There's a bird up there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it's just beautiful, and it's in pretty much the same shape. It hasn't been polished because polish can be corrosive, um, but it, it's just a beautiful set. And it, there are probably like uh, 10 pieces, all told, to the whole set. We, um, we are showing you three of them in the exhibit. Um, and it was made in, this one was made in like 1881. 81, thank you. I'm reading your notes. Yeah, good. 1881. <laughs> so I'm assuming again that it was purchased after Samuel came back to America and and um, Marietta becomes the hostess and they entertain in that beautiful um, big house. Yeah. Up on the Was mansion. On Washington Street. Yeah, quite a mansion. Um, so there's their silver set. Perfect. So that's the American side of some of their objects. Oh, this is that jewelry. I know. Um, this is what? It's jewelry. Oh no, no. <laughs> I was tempted to not even put it in there, but wear it and go look. Look. <laughs> I mean, it's just people would talk. I, do, I know. Yeah. Oh, Eileen's doing well. <laughs> Very well. Yeah. Um, so it's where are the police? <laughs> garnet and and silver, um, and it's just. I don't really need to say much about it. It's just it's just beautiful. Uh, although I do get a kick out of. Um, oh, Deb was going to show you uh, something, her brooch, yeah. Okay, well, People don't wear brooches all that much anymore, yeah. but they did in the 1800s. And when I first started coming to the dyer, Mrs. Coughlin um, ran the place, and I would bring my school children up here, and I would say, she's a woman who wears a brooch. And I would have to explain to my kids exactly what, what that, that was. Yeah. <laughs> so Deb has this, one. Yeah, so there's a, um, a Limoges brooch in the uh, case in here that you're you know, welcome to please look at. And I actually own one also, so I decided to wear it today. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so some women still wear brooches. So we we'll have to get them for the next meeting. We have bracelet in the middle. Uh, bracelet in the middle. And these earrings. are pierced earrings, which surprises me a little. Yeah. Uh, but uh, unless they were made into pierced earrings afterwards, Later. that could have happened yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, in Marietta's will, she did say to sell, sell everything. She wanted money to build this place for her. Mm -hmm. Uncle, and again, at the time that this is all happening, Abington still Abington, Rockland, Whitman. So he right. were they were a family of old Abington, uh, not just Abington. They had an affiliation with all sections. Mm -hmm. um, so, but in her will, she said, "I want you to sell everything, even my earrings and, and personal items." I don't know if this didn't sell. I maybe it was too expensive. I don't know. No one could um, afford to buy it. <laughs> right? Maybe that was it. But I'm glad that it didn't because we have it here. There you go. See? Yeah. That saved it for us to enjoy. And this is probably not the most valuable of the Dyer items that we have here at, at the Dyer. But it's local. But it's local. And again, I love that. <laughs> yeah. um, and also, they are kind of unusual. This, it, this is sandwich glass uh -huh. made down in Sandwich Mass. And um, I, I liked in the description of this, this is called a, a Vaseline colored. And when I thought, I was, oh yeah, it does look exactly Vaseline like Vaseline glass. does, yeah. yeah. Um, but the reason, part of the reason that that's an exhibit, other than them just being beautiful pieces, um, when the, uh, Marietta died in 1918, um, and her will was then executed, um, and in her will it was, have this wonderful place to store and talk about Abington Rockland Whitman history. Um, she wanted things sold off, and so they were. 
Um, but a man named Franklin Reed went to the auction, and we have a, a big poster of advertising the auction of the contents of the Dye household. And he went and he purchased as much as he could at the auction, and then he gave it back to the dyer. And these are three of the pieces that he purchased and gave to us. And then afterwards, he went to private dealers and, and looked for pieces that had come from the dyer house and also go, gave those. So giving to the dyer is a, a real important part of our history and present. D dating from the inception. Yeah, yes. Dating from the inception, Absolutely. from Not Marietta and, and Sam. You could say that Sam gave yeah. this too because it No, was we can have to say Samuel. Samuel, I know. <laughs> Sammy. I've maybe, now I'll, been, uh, maybe I'll call him Sam. I've been now corrected. So. <laughs> <I know. laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that sort of thing sticks with you. <laughs> yeah. Could that be called pressed glass? Some of it is pressed. I, I, I would say most of the sandwich glass yeah, that we have is pressed impression. glass. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's not carved out or anything, it's pressed glass. But they kind of are unusual shapes. That's called, um, I think that one's called a, a beehive pattern. And there are names to these, pa oh, that's um, daisy and button. I don't know. Daisy like little and daisies and those little round things. The buttons, yeah. 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 And that's a relish yeah. dish. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I added something to this, yeah. this collection of pieces that aren't on display because, well, the one I'm gonna show you is just too big. <laughs> it's stored away upstairs. But it talks about another aspect of their lives, entertaining and such. We have in the collection, it features several years ago, a music box, and I think it was 2012. We had Wade mm. Jenkins, who specialized in music boxes, come in, and he actually like oiled it up and got it working. Uh, it's, wow. it's stored away. We didn't bring that out for this. Um, there is a melodeon upstairs, uh, a reed organ that was made in Paris. So I'm assuming he brought it back over with him. It's probably the most ornate one I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, and uh, it's the case is in remarkable condition, but we know who made it, Alexandra Père and Fils uh, from Paris. And I looked them up and they, started in the early 1800s. They made, uh, I think they probably started making accordions and actually accordions and melodions, reed organs are very similar in how they make music. But uh, this is something that rich families had. Uh, they had them in their parlors and this was, this was entertainment. Uh, if you didn't have, this was before the age of player pianos but the notion you, you wouldn't have a pipe or well, some people have pipe organs in their houses, but not here. Uh, but this is something you would have. And as I said, it's upstairs. It really hasn't been seen for years, but we're sharing some pictures of it with you today because it's an unusual piece. It spoke to the entertainment in their lives and it's another thing that came from Paris. So um, he, he, he brought the culture back with him as well. And speaking of entertainment too, yes. um, you'll see a box of game pieces ah. that belong to Samuel. And this is no, pre-TV, pre- Pre-everything. Pre-everything. <laughs> so uh, parlor games were very popular and he okay. seemed to like them and playing cards and dominoes and whatnot. Something so, to pass yeah. the time. There was a teacher from center school that used to play this once in a while. Wow, okay. I can't remember which one. <laughs> it wasn't okay. me and I was never at center, so. Okay, uh, any questions for Eileen before we turn her loose? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, from what you're saying, it sounds like most of the nieces remained single. No, some did marry. One married and lived on Orange Street. Um, I know I can't remember about the other ones, but I, uh, Marietta did not. She she never married. And then when Samuel came back in '62, I don't know how old she would have been, but she lived till 1918. So um, she just remained single, no children, and it's probably also why uh, we were able to get this place because they didn't have children to leave it to. Do you remember any of the others off the top of your head we that married? We have the, genie, the pedigree chart right. in the other room, right. and I'd be happy to give you the details on yeah. them and talk about that's part of what we do here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so became, some, it, some of them did. One became a born, one became a gurney. There's a whip okay. marsh, so one became a whip marsh. So Marietta may have been the only one that didn't marry. Okay, thanks. Hmm? Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Oh. Is that fish come mm -hmm. with the uh, daisies and buttons and on this? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Because I'm thinking it might be bachelor buttons. Oh, bachelor. Okay. The sign on it when I looked at it said daisy and but yeah. sounds good. I'm not an expert in oh, sandwich okay. class. 
But I think yeah. we do have an expert in creamware, the creamware. So if you have any creamware collection, could, do you collect it? Uh, well, I, I couldn't afford a real one, but I, <laughs> when, when I, okay. I had one made with the uh, Peabody Museum. We, oh. and when I was in the museum business, I, I got the Peabody Museum, we made one. Uh, it was quite common for British uh, uh, companies right after the American Revolution to uh, send a lot of, uh, of Stratosphere and Liverpool wear it to the United States. Uh, for profit, and they, they would have Judge Washington on it, right. or they had the Constitution on it, but they didn't care about the politics or the patriotism. Just they what would sell. One of the problems. <laughs> what would sell. So, uh, you know, the Liverpool Judge was commemorated much of the uh, Marine stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, okay. uh, they would have some for, you say, Nelson in England, but uh, right. it was just during the federal period, and sort of the, the taste changed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm as we go to mid 19th right. century. If you go to auction sites online, it still comes up and people still, collectors still want it. Yeah, it we, well, they, they appeal to, to yeah, exactly. males, I think, because they're all sh quite often maritime subjects. Right, right. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And next I'm going to invite Merlin Liberty to come forward and talk about uh, the Dyer legacy, if you will, and this building and a few other related topics. So first of all, welcome. Hello everyone, <laughs> hi. And, and uh, I say this not in any bad way, but you're not from Abington. You're not even from Massachusetts. Do I have that right? I am not. Okay. But my family is. There you go. In fact, they skipped from Way they they skipped Abington from Weymouth and they went straight to Brockton. Okay. So they didn't. I'm, I'm not even sure they waved as they were going by. <laughs> so that's so. okay. That but works think too. of me as uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who <laughs> came to America, toured around, and then said, "Here are all the good things and bad things about this country." So, <laughs> so um, that's one of the best things that's happened is working here. Is I've learned so much. American history. Where did you come from? I didn't quite get it. I came, I'm from New Mexico. Oh, okay. So my early American history it's is very not different. yours <laughs> at all. It's very interesting. Very the different. And it's been fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And now here in the Dyer, you uh, title is librarian. I am the I've executive heard. director for the Dyer Memorial Library. There we go. I assumed that role after the retirement of Joyce Himawan, who had been here for over 20 years, 22 years. And uh, it's been absolutely fabulous since the beginning when I was a student at Simmons getting my uh, library and information science degree and archives management and so on and so forth and all of that. Can I pause for one absolutely. moment here? I just want everyone to know that the exhibit in there and the stories that you're hearing and all of this, it takes a village. <laughs> and there's people that hear that that you know, although uh, Deb has spoken, Eileen has spoken, there's two other people that really need to be recognized for this, and that is P. Walters, yeah. because he he um, is the best assessors, records, researchers <laughs> in the world in all of Abington, which is fantastic. Abington is the world. <laughs> there, there we go, uh, Abington, Rockland, Whitman, and then. Um, also, uh, Lisa McGovern, who isn't here today. Um, so all of this team, we, it takes all of us to figure out what we want to talk about, figure out how to display things, ideas, do the research to share all of this with you. And this happens um, not just for exhibits, but it, it happens uh, throughout our day-to-day -day operations when we're, when we're figuring out you know, how we want to share this information with the community. So. And also, Pete and Janice, I want to make sure that you know that they have also uh, donated the flag to us that's flying out there right now. This yeah. is because we didn't have one for a while, so we're Long really while. glad to have it. So, yeah, there <laughs> Long we go. Long while. So. Good to have it back. Yeah. Anyway, um, Sam passed, but he, um, his, his niece, Marietta, mm -hmm. um, took over. At that point, she had already been hostessing for him to begin with. So. Was she just the one named in the will? I, how, how did that come to pass? So we don't know anything about how she assumed the property. I suppose someone can go look at the deeds. 
who's really good at deed research. And there, there are a number of you in here I know who can do that very well. Um, what I am uh, more familiar with is her will. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, there are no pictures of that because it's a will. who wants to read wills? <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's words. It doesn't look good on screen. Um, and so she took her uncle's money after living a really great life with him, it sounds like, um, and did what women of wealth in the Gilded Era did. So that's the, she was Gilded Age. So that's the late 1890s, you know, 1880s, 1890s. That's when, uh, you know, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, you know, all of, all of that is happening. Not so much here. We don't have that type of tragedy, I don't believe. But, Thank you. But uh, one of the things that women could do if they had wealth and did do is they were some of the big movers and shakers with creating um, history-related organizations, institutions. So she just slotted right into that by creating the Dyer Memorial Library um, that also is home to the Historical Society of Old Abington mm -hmm. that came about eight years later. So when she died, um, 13 days after she signed her will. Interesting uh, timing. Yes, <laughs> I mean, we, we, I say we got pretty lucky that way. Uh, among the things that she said in her will was not only to build this place, but also to make sure that it was decorated with the items that didn't sell in the auctions that has already been spoken about. And then also uh, to gather up lots of maps and, and documents and photos and everything that, that to start this collection. And then also uh, one of the trustees was uh, Dr. Gilman Osgood. He, uh, of his own volition, even though they were both trustees were supposed to do this, he was the one who went out and uh, collected all of the books that you see on these shelves here that have to do with the town histories of uh, Massachusetts. So what is incredible about these books on these shelves and pamphlets and so on is that this makes the Dyer probably one of the most desirable places to visit because we have it here, live and in person, and very few other institutions have this type of a collection. We are incredibly fortunate to have this because that's what's written in her will, do this, and Dr. Osgood mm. went out and, and did it. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, there are just a lot of really incredibly special things about this place. And with the new, uh, residents in all three towns that are coming in here. They want to find out their history. I think what I see here are more mature faces <laughs> that tell me that, you know, you've, you've lived in this area or associated with this area, you've been for, for quite a few years. <laughs> so there are, you know, as many of you have probably noticed, there's a lot of change in the population of you know, new, new residents are moving in, and that's where the house histories come in, and everybody's very keen to learn about that. So they get to do that. They get to learn this about, you know, the other towns. There's a lot of deep interest in this, so. Now, we're surrounded by the philanthropy of the niece. Mm -hmm. Samuel, I notice I'm correcting myself now. Yes, Samuel. <laughs> Samuel uh, apparently was philanthropic in his own right. He was. But I'm curious because having known other histories of wealthy people in town around the same time, they didn't put their names on anything. Did he? Here's the way, it's very interesting about that. Th there is a spectrum of philanthropy during this era. Mm -hmm. There's either you put your name on everything. Yeah which, and, and I'm speaking broadly, yep. that would be um, Carnegie. Go to Rockland, Carnegie you have a libraries. Carnegie have Libraries. Yeah. Yeah. Then there's Rockefeller, who's like, I don't want my name anywhere, I no whiff of it. So he creates shell companies. For this area, I would say that there's some humble bragging 
going on. Okay. For instance, Crossett was not at all uh, opposed to having a lot of ink about him in the newspapers. But. The same for <laughs> Moses Arnold. Right. Not really a but. Well, uh, no, no, uh, no. Okay. He's he, there's there's his name is everywhere. Okay. Same for Moses Arnold with a Civil War soldier. Well, everyone knows who, who it, it was. Is, okay, <laughs> so the reference so, is the plaque on the abolitionist stone at Island Grove. Right. He didn't put his name on it, but it wasn't a very well kept secret. Exactly, and and so this is this type of, uh, and also during this era, there's a, there is. A lot of, you know, everyone knows who's got the money. It's very clear, you know. You they got own a, factories. You, you got a home. You got a home that shows you the money. They have factories and so on and so forth. So really it ranged that spectrum. Mm -hmm. For Samuel, he actually was, as Deb said, he was a very kind, very generous person. And he was, from what we have in our collection, and really everything that we have is through our interpretation nowadays, based on the information that we have, mm -hmm. is that he was very generous, but quietly so, except when it came to the public libraries. It seems as though he was very, very interested in books and reading and definitely, you know, elevating oneself through public libraries. And so the there's, uh, in the room there, um, in the other exhibit room, there is the, I think it's 1891 Abington Public Library catalog. And it is, uh, he is mentioned as being one of the two largest donors of books over X number of years. Um, so he really is called out then mm -hmm. for his generosity. And, uh, you know, one could say that, you know, modern libraries in town were due to him and um, the other individual who made these donations. So, mm -hmm. you know, he, he was very generous that way. But still, I mean, you're talking about a listing that someone else was calling him out as being a donor, as opposed to him saying, look at me, I donated right. this. Because the other one that comes to mind, Crossett, who, who owned a shoe factory in town, uh, and was ridiculously wealthy, um, gave us the eagle on top of the arch at Island Grove, but also uh, when the Adams Street School was being rebuilt, he, um, the bids came in too high. And they were going to put it back up to bid, and he said, no, 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 I will cover the overages and I will originally equip, uh, equip it with the desks and everything else they need. I will do that. And the question came back, well, why? And he said, well, all of my work as kids go there. But there was a movement to name the school after him. No, no, he wouldn't do it. But again, as you say, everyone the knew it. The everyone town knew. of Whitman, the <laughs> town of Whitman will give, they will, the family will give a, you know, money to buy a park. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just change our name from to, South Abington to, to Whitman. Whitman. <laughs> We're, we won't fight that, you know, that sort of thing. But yeah, yeah. you know, there's, it's, it's a very interesting, you know, even today, what we decide to give to, whether you want to buy a brick to support a place, to have your, your family's name on it, to have your name on it as a donor. I mean, there's a lot of uh, different levels of, of uh, philanthropy, you know, and, and really in an archives, we interpret what we have in front of us using whatever historical elements to try to put it in context. But if we had time machines, <laughs> then we could find out for sure. What they really you know, meant. But we, we, we do the best <laughs> we can in the meantime. So what I wanted to say with, with this yes. picture, I mean, it doesn't make sense when you look at well, it, it superficially. <laughs> Basically, we have that mansion that was around. Thank you, Pete. That was pretty much around from 1867 until it burned in 1936. There's only the carriage house left. So 1867 to 1936, that's as long as that mansion was around. Mm -hmm. Then the carriage house, which is this side, that, yeah. that was there until uh, it was demolished in 1998. The dyer 
has been around since 1932. So right now, we outlived them all. We have outlived <laughs> the mansion and we have more history and we continue to collect the history and we're still able to to share it with everyone. Absolutely. So that is, you know, the the mansion has been transformed into this building and the resources and people that we have here to share it with you and we're chugging along and we're going to keep going along for everyone. So that's quite quite an investment that Samuel didn't realize he was making. Well, his niece did it. Yeah, there um, you go. So. There, there's a story I heard, um, maybe you can verify it, that um, the depression was the best thing that happened to the <laughs> building of the Dyer Library. And I heard because it went out to bid before the depression, they couldn't afford it, the numbers came in too high, and, and during the depression, suddenly it was affordable. Is, is there some truth to that? Do you know? Um, I personally don't know that. Okay. Again, that's, that's uh, but I'd say it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, just, you got a couple of things going on here. Marietta died in 1918. We are, we, two, two major things are happening. Mm. Anybody know? End of World War. One, the, and, the plague, the Spanish flu. And, <laughs> yes, okay, so we have those going on in 1918. So it's going to take a while for her will to get probated anyway. And then, as you said, you know, there's some economic issues going on yeah. in the country. And so, and in the meantime, we've got an auction that has to go on that has to, you know, go out and collect the books. We have all of these other things going on. And then, yes, the Great Depression. Yeah. So it all makes, it all fits. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you that that's yeah. most likely what happened. What happened? It, it's a scenario, it was presented to me and I thought, well, that makes sense. Yeah. But I you know, hadn't pursued it any further right. than that. Um, another date that as we're talking about these things coming together, um, in 1912, Abington celebrated its bicentennial as a town. And there was a huge, exhibit at the then high school, um, the predecessor to our Frolio school. There was another school on that site, but it was, I think, perhaps the first time a major, major exhibit had been mounted, but suddenly local history and town history was important. Everyone, you, you bought tickets, you came in, you saw it, and the celebration went on through the three towns and it went on for weeks. So um, I'm wondering, I have wondered for some time with her passing just a few years down the road from that, if she was inspired, I guess, I guess we'll never know. But Again, it's that slot yeah. of Gilded Age. Yeah. This is what women did. History was yeah. definitely important to across the country of women of a certain mm -hmm. uh, economic status. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that that had something to do with it, but it wasn't the sole- It wasn't group. the driving force. It wasn't the driving force. Um, there was, uh, yes, uh, well, yeah, one thing back with the building okay. itself, there's something else, it's a sort of like go. broad, unintended, unintended philanthropy, <laughs> which is a good thing. So, in addition to the depression and building this building and that sort of thing, around that time, the town of Abington needed a new center Abington library. And one of the trustees just happened to be named Coughlin, who happened to be involved in town government. And- Surprise. Surprise, they kind of leveraged her money to build a branch or, you know, for the center library, the Dyer Fund, Marietta's money. Uh, her trustees were very generous with that. And so they basically bought the town of Abington a library mm -hmm. and they built it all in their time. Not only did the, not only did the, uh, Marietta Dyer's money build this library, they also furnished everything in the library. Mm -hmm. And so the town of Abington got a free library for roughly 50 years mm -hmm. until it moved out. And it was, um, uh, they charged a basically rent that equaled the property taxes. So they were making nothing mm -hmm. off of this wonderful gift that was saving Abington taxpayers loads of money. 
Um, and then, um, you know, around, you know, during the 70s, the late 70s, um, that's when the world was changing with regard to public libraries and the thought to, you know, consolidate into a single, you know, building and so on and so forth, that's what happened. And it was um, a bit of a blow when they moved out mm. because the dyer still needed the rent and the place had only been nonprofit for a certain period of time. I don't remember the years exactly. So this money was helping to pay the bills, basically. Um, so when it left, that was, uh, there's uh, one of the trustees that at the time was Colonel Joe Murphy, and he, he writes in a letter, he says, well, you know, this is disappointing because we could really use, you know, this money because, to help us. Yeah. But, you know, when you think about it, I mean, what a gift to the town you, that, that is very quiet that nobody knew about mm -hmm. again. So, you know, and, and it wasn't, I don't disagree with that, but I'm not sure that, you know, you think in your will it's going to go one way and, and they managed to make it go both ways. When they did leave, actually, that was a blessing because the, the space, you know, everything that the Dyer had been collecting and HSOA had been collecting, you know, it was stuffed to the gills. Mm. So now there's far more space to actually store everything. And as we acquire more, um, you know, that's, it's, it's helpful. So yay, they're gone. <laughs> but, but um, you know, still, it was, now, it was challenging. This so. photograph is taken in what was the reading room of the mm -hmm. public library, mm -hmm. the back room where I'm going to release you soon to have some refreshments and, and to talk more. But um, anyway, so the side door was the front door to the library. When we go through the double doors from this wing, mm -hmm. everything beyond that was the public library, the stacks, which were closed stacks mm -hmm. and everything else. Mm -hmm. And what is now a computer room back there was the children's library. Uh, Folks from my generation still remember coming here to use this library and, and have stories, and they're wonderful stories. Well, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to name names, but yeah. Uh, so anyway, but obviously, you know, everything is still very much in use and, and library, and you're also now using the term archives. Well, that's uh, one of the things that what does everyone think when you hear the word library? Take out a book. <laughs> there you go. And what else happens when you, you, like you said, check out a book? Oh, yeah. We're not circulating. Mm. We have a lot of old stuff that is paper and, uh, and other artifacts. We collect history, you know, historical or history-related items. There is confusion. When you hear the word library, the expectation time and time again, people come in here thinking that they can check out a book and that the services that we provide are that of a public library. We're not. So archives truly, you know, and again, we the name has not been formally changed to that legally, uh, but that describes better what occurs in this building and is it's more a museum this is more like no we are not a museum she never set it up to be a museum there is no mention of museum at all she said display cases for certain items but there's no it is it is again to change things out every now and then but that is not what she asked for so we're beginning to run a little late, so let's um, summarize, I think. The so the last yes. thing I yes. want to say, the last yes. thing I want to say is that we've been talking about everything that came from the, you know, 18, late 1800s, early 20th century. We are now in the 21st century. Yes, we've been collecting things or, or reaching out to people to gather things to sustain the history of this, of these three towns. We are facing a memory hole with the wonderful dawning of the internet age. We are no longer receiving hard copy photographs. We are not receiving any uh, printed documents. We're not receiving any records because we're all doing it digitally. 
we're not the only place that is facing this memory hole. Our world is. And the people who visit us and the people who contact us asking for information, we can only give them what we have. But if nobody hands us any printed photographs, any printed documents, we can't share it with them. And let me tell you, that's going to be very sad for all of us. Moving forward, yeah. Moving forward, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so that's, um, you'll see in the cases back there, some of the more recent donations, um, including, thanks to Donald Can, we have at the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, there was a kid in Rockland who made, who printed, 3D printed some masks. That speaks to the era. We can describe that in the future going forward about this crazy period that we went through. We also have uh, the first vial of vaccine for COVID that came from the health department of Abington. Um, <clears throat> then there's uh, the, uh, one of the, uh, I think it's Commonwealth Shoe Factory. Amazing things from them, including uh, a wonderful product catalog from the 70s all the way to when they closed. So, you know, there's these sorts of things we want from you. We don't want you to do an arm sweep off of the table into the garbage because, you know, <laughs> things you think may not have any importance. Let us be the judge. We, we have the education. We know in general, what people are seeking, we can help you with that. And, um, you know, and also, you know, contact Doug for all of this as well. You know, any way that we can preserve the history of all three communities, you know, we, we want your help. I've been That's saying it. for years, if there is only one of something, it belongs here. Because <laughs> this is the only way everyone will have access to it is if it's here. Right. Uh, I just heard the other day, and this is probably news to you, that uh, the Abington Historic Commission, with their collections, are looking to rehouse them, probably here. So that's something that, that will come. Be, I have a joint meeting coming up with them. Okay. That's something coming down All the right. pike. And this that, again, they have a room at the public library right. that no one ever goes in. Right. So they're looking at their collections saying, where would this do the most good? And guess where they're looking? And uh, that makes the perfect sense because mm -hmm. we have received another gift from the town of Abington. We also get wonderful things from Rockland and, and Whitman from the towns themselves. Mm -hmm. They recognize the importance of this. But one of the most incredible gifts that we've recently received has been from the veteran services officer in Abington. Cleaning out his office, paper record starting from when, Pete? 40s. The 1940s, a little bit before the 1940s, so we have World War II mm -hmm. veterans information to up, and then we have embargoed things starting from the mid to late 70s because those, it is more likely that those who were they're still, served, they're still living. Yeah. So none of us are seeing that. Nope. But this gift has come to us. The town also kindly furnished the filing cabinets to put these records in, um, you know, and, and we are organizing these because, I mean, this, you know, this speaks to the long history in all three towns of citizenship and service to one's country. Abington, at the very beginning of the American Revolution, had some of the, you know, original, you know, yes, they were colonists, but we have incredible patriots here, including African American slaves who are patriots. And this is, and, and the uh, willingness to serve one's country in that manner is very deep rooted in all three towns. So the fact that we have these new records coming in is just fantastic for us. So the Historical Commission, absolutely, we welcome them. There you go. You, went, you bet. Well, I was thinking, that everybody of you know, like like mind like when people are downsizing and we are told to get rid of it you know and I'm thinking oh my god what they're getting rid of we're the yeah. ones that are holding yeah. mm -hmm. and we're in bed and that the, the, the new stuff that you were talking about the mask and the vial that's a time capsule as far as I'm concerned but we want to share well, with people need, we need it but 
to me, that's you know. Hmm. If you don't collect it now, when are we going to collect it? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, so but we don't want to keep it out of sight and out of mind oh, because no, no, they're, no, you know, I didn't that's. I mean that. I mean, to me, that that would be like a, a separate a separate entity unto, unto itself. Mm. That would be the progression of time cancelled. But mm. we've got the stuff. Mm -hmm. You and do. We don't know what to do with that <laughs> stuff. Right. It's it's. Well, it's, you need to have a conversation with Merlin. So. Yeah, we can help you with that. <laughs> yeah, because I've got a couple of things now that I, okay. Anyway. The ancestors and well, yeah. this is a discussion. I'd like to continue on over refreshments in the back room, unless there are burning questions we need to address now. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. One last thing I want to one last thing I want to say to everyone here is that the programs that. Doug presents for the Historical Society of Old Ag Abington are, they're always great. And I think you should spread the word with everyone uh -huh. to make sure that people show up and attend them because they're always fascinating topics. And, and uh, if you can't twist their arms, we're on YouTube. There you go. That was, that was the next place I was going to say. So there you go. So thank you, Doug. Thank you. And thank you to our videographer, Paul Watson, for thank joining you. us today. And because of him, you will be able to see this on Abington Cam and local stations and on YouTube. So please join us back here in about a month where we'll be talking about that old town religion. Uh, there are some cards on the entry, the middle table in, in the hall there. If you wanted to grab one, we will be mailing them out to our regular mailing list and emailing them to our email list. But I wanted them ready for today. Um, and that will probably be our last program of the season. And we'll talk about moving forward from there. But now go eat. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. What a great audience. <laughs>